Hi everyone, so here we are, the last day of level 2 in South Africa. Praise the Lord for our high recovery rates and for the decrease in new infections. We are so excited for level 1 and the opportunity for us to fully open our church again. Yes, if you have not heard, not only are our evening services now open, but as from Sunday, the 4th of October, our morning services will be open too. We realize that this virus does not understand levels and still operates in the same manner. And so we ask everyone to continue being cautious and keep following protocols. We will now be able to accept a capacity of about 117 people in our services. All will be asked to wear masks covering your nose and mouth and temps and information will need to be recorded. All windows will be open to allow for free flowing ventilation and seating distance will be practiced between persons who are not of the same household. Unfortunately, our children's church will be unable to open at this time as our classrooms and playgrounds are being utilized by our preschool only. Children are welcome under the parents' discretion and supervision. Please note, our cry room is only available to babies under one year old. It's advised that seniors, especially those with comorbidities, are more cautious. However, each adult is able at their own discretion to come to a decision. Even though we initially will be unable to serve tea and coffee, we, will st we are still looking forward to worshipping, being fed by the word and reconnecting. Please know that Dean and I are available to address any of your concerns or to answer your questions you might have. If you'd like to meet in person, please do not hesitate to phone the church office to book a time or send a message through to the church WhatsApp number displayed here and we will follow up. Our online Bible studies are under review. However, at present, they will continue as usual. Please be aware that the ladies' morning Bible study group is open to be attended at church on Tuesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. All ladies are welcome. Thank you again to all those who continue faithfully giving tithes and offerings. Please take note of our church banking details seen here. Our Thursday evening prayer list will continue to be posted online. Please keep praying with us as we continue to stand together in these times. To have your prayer requests included, send them through to our church WhatsApp number. Then again, please remember to share this morning's message link with your friends and family. And then, as we go up a level this week, can I leave you with this thought? The deepest level of worship is reached when we keep praising in spite of the pain. When we keep thanking God, even during our trials. When we keep trusting God, even when we are tempted to lose hope. And when we keep growing in faith, even when those around deny Him. Let's step it up a level. Good morning, church family. Wow, I can't help but get excited to know that very soon I won't be preaching to a camera anymore, but rather um, be able to see your lovely faces in front of me once again. For those who are, would like to continue watching and following us online, don't panic. We're going to continue to keep posting our messages online for the foreseeable future. So then back to this morning's message as we continue to examine Peter's second letter to the Christians in the church of Asia Minor as we broadly tackle the whole of chapter 2 this morning. And I'd like you to follow with me uh, to Peter chapter 2 and we're going to be reading verses 1 through to verse 22. But before we do that, let's just commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for a brand new day. We want to thank you for the opportunity of being able to live our lives for you in times of uncertainty, knowing that you're the only certain one. And so this morning, as your word is proclaimed, we pray, Father, that it might go out and not return void, but that it indeed may accomplish every good and perfect purpose that you've intended in Christ Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. 2 Peter from chapter 2 from verse 1 through to verse 22. And I'm going to be reading from the NIV this morning. And it's under the title of false teachers and their destructions from verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with their stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world when He brought the flood on, on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning to ashes, and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man, living among them day by day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not slander nor bring slander and accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like beasts, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasure while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and accused brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow their way of Balaam of Burr. They followed the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These men are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Blackness, darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Saviour and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. For them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to it vomit. And a sow that is washed goes back to a wallowing in the mud. Wow, what a, a real complex and a, an extensive portion of scripture that we're looking at this morning. And yet it's one that we cannot afford to dismiss or pay no attention to. How sad it is that in this very day and age we find this very strong warning and explanation that Peter needs to uh, include in his letter to the early church, to these new Christians, a warning of false teachers, of their influence on the church and their impending destruction. Even more sad is the truth that we as Christians even more urgently in the day and age in which we live today, need to be aware of that until the Lord's return on the clouds, 
the devil will never stop trying to influence humanity, seeking to twist the truth of God's word and deceive as many people as he can from following the truth of Jesus Christ. Well, friends, last week we saw how Peter, in the end of chapter 1, warned and challenged these new Christians to stand firm and established in the truth of God, a truth which should um, detract and overrule our everyday thoughts, words, and actions. A truth that gives to us a bigger picture of life that needs to not only be a presence and a reality in our lives today, but a word that would encourage us with regards to future rewards and the reality of what the future holds for us. As God's children today, more than ever before, we need to realize that the evil one does not want us to accept, apply, and practice God's truth, God's word in our lives. He wants us rather to be deceived, disarmed, and destroyed. And yes, that is the title of my message this morning. The devil knows that at Calvary's cross, Jesus won the victory for us. Yet in this remaining time that he has left, he is like, as the word of God, as Peter reminds us, like a roaring lion seeking to devour those whom he can, to, to deceive, to disarm, and to destroy. So let me put it in the most simplest of terms to you this morning. The devil does not want to go down alone. He wants to take as many of God's creation down with him as possible. We need to take note, dear friends, of the teaching that Peter is giving to us today. We need to stand strong in the word of God and its truth. We need to stay alert for the evil one will use flesh and blood, false teachers, to deceive, to disarm, and to destroy many people. This morning, I would like to keep this complex portion of Scripture as uncomplicated as possible by simply just dividing it into three portions. The nature of deception, the tactics of deception, and the results of deception. So then this morning, let's start off by looking at all the portions that tell us this morning about the nature of deception. Peter starts off in chapter 2 by confirming that false prophets still exist. They existed before Jesus and they still existed in Peter's time and they exist today. False prophets. People who claim to speak on behalf of the Lord, but who actually twist and add on their own version of the truth for their own benefits. And this, friends, we need to realize will always exist. In these scriptures before us this morning, Peter describes these false prophets and teachers, and he describes their very nature. He speaks about the way they act and the way that you and I will be able to recognize them. In verse 1, we are told, Take a look, says, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord. Very carefully and under disguise of truth, they introduce heresies. Heresies, friends, are untruths. People's own uh, devised opinions, which are seen as truth, even though they contradict or even twist the word of God. They are very cleverly introducing their own opinions above the sovereign truth of God's word. Our God is sovereign. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the source of life. He is the giver of life. His truth is the only truth that you and I need. However, these teachers or these prophets twist the ultimate and overall truth of God's word. Friends, God's standards and ways are clearly defined for us in his word, the Bible. God's plan for family, for marriage, for creating humanity as male and female is clearly laid out for us. Yet under the guise 
of grace and changing times, these false prophets bring the, the clear defined truths of God's word into disputes. Verse 3 tells us, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. In other words, these teachers would want you to be willing to follow and to believe their more favorable versions and interpretations of Scripture, which under their version of grace doesn't hold or make us uncomfortable or even hold anyone accountable. To God's law and righteous living requirements. These false teachers are motivated by a desire for money. They are willing to uh, commercialize the Christian faith for their own self-advantage. They are willing to exploit those who are, are new in the faith, those who have not yet gained a solid biblical foundation. Yet in verse 10 we see a further description of these false prophets nature. Verse 10 says, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise the authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. These false teachers despise authority. They despise having to answer to anyone but themselves. They and their own fleshly desires of, for the, of their sinful nature. They set themselves up as leaders of churches sitting on golden thrones, for prophets, and so and so and so, dressed in white suits and gold trimmings, never question what they say. They are above the, the normal people. They claim to have a special revelation outside of Scripture. Sadly, all of this and so much more exists in the world in which you and I live today. Look around in society today. Most people we see do not hold themselves accountable to God's righteous laws of holy living. The media promotes self-indulgence. You do what you want to do. Do whatever makes you feel good. It doesn't matter if it doesn't hurt anyone else as long as you get what you want. That's what's promoted. No one wants to obey or be held accountable to the law and to rules. Even the laws and the rules of our very own country. One of my colleagues just shared with us a little while ago uh, through this lockdown. We see the rebellious nature of humanity as people seek to break out and break loose. These teachers promote the world's version of relevant truth. The belief that there are no absolute truths. Truth is always relative and, ad and adaptable to each circumstance and culture. You can behave the way you like if you believe it's right. The philosophy of if it feels right, then it must be right. After all, God wouldn't want you to be unhappy. What they preach is that law, obligation, accountability, righteous, holy living is not necessary anymore. Jesus has set you free. These teachings are heresies. These are the things that itching ears want to hear. They are not God's absolute truth, dear friends. Verse 10 tells us that they are bold and arrogant. These men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. These leaders and teachers can come across as being very charming, pleasing in appearance, confident and very persuasive in what it is that they say. They dismiss anyone they feel is a threat to them. They are bold and arrogant and uh, intimidating to say the least. Commentators say that in reference to not being afraid to slander celestial beings, it refers to them not being afraid to slander, to criticize, and to bring down other earthly dignitaries or other church leaders. They make their people suspicious or afraid to listen to anyone else. Verse 12 goes on to explain more about their very nature. But these men blaspheme in matters that they do not understand. These false teachers use God's name, may I say, in vain. They use God's name to pronounce their own thinking and their own perversions. 
Again, biblical commentators say that they lean towards being Gnostic, who claim to have special power and knowledge outside and additional to Scripture, to the Word of God. Verse 14 tells us, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed uh, and accused brood. They have eyes full of adultery. They want what others have. They seduce the unstable, the new converts, and they do it in order to enrich themselves. Christian friends, we become unstable in our thinking when we allow a mindset set of, uh, I'm never going to get enough to enter our souls. We become unsatisfied and we look at this world to uh, uh, validate us. Verse 17 tells us, these men are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. Their roots are rotten. They have no true foundation. Their teachings are based on lies and not on true spiritual water from God's word. Sadly, the people who are influenced by these impressive preachers are never fed the true solid nourishing word of God and so when the storms of life come they are unable to stand firm now very briefly let us see some of the the tactics of deception the tactics are to come across strong confident and impressive in their words and their performance listen to verse 18 what Peter says he says for they mouth empty boastful words and by appealing to the lustful desires of the sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. In verse 18, we are told how they appeal to the sinful nature of man. They can have riches. Um, you can have riches. You can have fame. God will give you everything you want. Just believe. That's the proclamation of what is told on a daily basis to so many. You see, the devil likes to make us believe that we're missing out. He always appeals to our lustful nature, to wanting more, and to be focused on our own comforts and our own wants, instead of living sacrificially for God and His purposes for our lives, which stand forevermore. Our sinful nature always craves what's easy, temporary, and a quick fix. Another tactic of the evil one uses is with, in fo using false teachers and prophets is found in verse 19. Take a look at what Peter says. He says, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves to depravity for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. They promise a freedom, a grace with no accountability so as to indulge your own sinful desires. These leaders, dear friends, give the impression that they are free and powerful when really they themselves are victims of their own greed and their own depravity. For a, a minute they knew God and experienced true, true freedom from their sins, only to then twist and use this freedom to justify going back to their own sinful ways, just like a dog goes back to vomit and a pig back to mud. The devil's tactics are to create fear in us, fear about change. He wants us to believe that we can never change, that we're uh, in inherently bad. He does not want us to become free from sin, trusting in the Lord and being led by God the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Truth. He wants us to believe that it is easier for us to go back to the mud. Finally, let us see the results of deception. Our God is and always has been a God of holy, righteous standards. He will always act against sin. Opportunity is given for true repentance and change. However, when people return to the evil ways, when sin and wickedness is chosen above worshipping and serving God, His judgment and punishment will be sure. Look at some of the statements that are made about the results and the consequences that will follow these prophets' choices and our choices too if we fall into this trap. Take a look at verse 3. 
Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. In verse 5 and verse 6, If he did not spare the ancient world, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning to ash and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and then verse 13, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. I trust that you and I will get the big picture that there are results to deception. Our holy God will not tolerate sin and this earth will be purged of sin and judgment and consequences paid in full. We need to hear these words and these warnings this morning. We need to pay attention if we're going to escape the traps of the evil one. Let us not be lulled into a place of accommodating or even accepting or participating in anything that is not of the Lord. God's Holy Spirit, His Spirit of Truth lives within us if we call ourselves children of God, Christians. And the Spirit of God is given to us to give us godly wisdom to lead us into biblical truth and to give us godly discernments. Let us, especially now in these perilous days, guard our hearts and our minds in the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friends. In closing, God knows how to rescue godly men from trials. God will rescue us. The times we are living in are indeed like Sodom and Gomorrah. However, our God is able to protect us he rescued Lot, and He can rescue us. Our God rescues His righteous children, and He holds accountable those who deceive and who are deceived. Friends, the warning is clear. Let us choose carefully how we live. Let us pray this morning. Father, I want to pray this morning that by Your Spirit and through the truth of Your Word, you will search our hearts and our lives. And that, Lord, you would, by your Spirit and through the truth of your word, reveal to us again this morning that which is not truth, that which is not pleasing, that which is sinful in our lives. So that as you reveal it, we might be able to repent of it and walk afresh and anew in that relationship you call us to. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you and spare you till we meet again. God bless.